energy democracy is in fact many things. Right? On the one hand, um, it's a vision. It's a vision statement. The book itself sort of lays out a vision of what kind of society we actually want, what we want the world to be, the values that matter to us most, um, what is it that the quality of life that we want to be as, as humans. But it's also about a book about community-centered initiatives, right? And the book offers a rich collection of narratives, stories, case studies uh, about the clean economy and why it matters, and particularly why it matters to everyday people. Right? What the fossil fuel economy is doing, not just to our environment, but also how it's affecting the livelihood, the health of everyday folks, and especially low-income communities of color. The book is, in some way, a how-to manual. Right? So while we talk about the philosophy and the values and the concept, there's really amazing stories, and I'll tell you some of them this evening, about what people are doing on the ground, what these grassroots initiatives are doing to take power into their own hands, figuratively and literally. Um, what individual households are doing, what government's doing, what community institutions like your hospitals and, and your universities and public housing, how they are participants and stakeholders in the forging of these, this energy democracy con uh, uh, concept. One that is not just about energy, but that leads with racial and social justice at its core. But the book is also sort of, in some ways, it's a, it's a nonfiction, very clearly, but it has all the elements of a, of a good fiction. And so what does the good fiction give you? It gives you a theme, right? So the theme um, is really about how we are losing, how the earth is losing its generative abilities and its powers that's needed to sustain itself and us as human, as a human species. So there's a theme, there's a setting. The setting is now, it is here and now. It's about the United States in a global context of climate change, an unprecedented historical political moment that we're in, characterized the convergence of a dying planet. It's in the loss of the biodiversity, a dying fossil fuel industry fighting for its last gasp. It is about the extreme weather events that we're experiencing, as in this last fall, the frequency and the ferocity of drought, wildfires, and hurricanes. It's about also the growing convergence of our social, racial, and economic justice movements. Very dynamic times. The setting is really a dynamic setting. There's a plot to this book, right? And I think you all know what the plot is all about. It's about the mindless pursuit of multinational corporations that are scheming to make profits over planet and people, right? In pursuit of capital accumulation and world dominance without regard to our environment, without regard to the loss of our ecological diversity, our public health impacts, or without regard to the will of the people. And in this plot, there's also the complicity of the federal government here and now, right? They're marshalling the political powers and wherewithal of the government to prop up an extractive industry, right, that's on its last breath, right? We're abdicating on the climate accord, the Paris Accord. We are, in fact, uh, repealing environmental laws. We're selling off our natural resources to the highest bidder, you know, where we're giving away offshore leases, you know, to, to, to the highest bidder in very ecologically sensitive parts of the world, in, in the Arctic, for example, or even the offshore drilling that's now being promoted everywhere except where? <laughs> Mar Largo, Florida. All right, where we're permitting, you know, gas and oil pipelines on sovereign land and ecologically sensitive land. So we have the corporate agenda trying to resuscitate the fossil fuel industry, and we have a government now uh, advancing this. So, but this book also, besides the plot, it has a point of view. And the point of view 
is that the outcome is not inevitable, right? And that it demands a total resolve on your part and our part and, a, and the resources that's needed to bring a new value proposition into sort of the state of where we are in the world. It's got characters, they're good guys, and they're bad guys. And guess what? You all have a plot, you all have a role in the storyline. You are all characters in the storyline. And it clearly, as every good novel does, have, has conflict. The conflict is between, you name it, dirty energy versus clean energy, the has versus the have nots, the extractive economy versus the generative economy. There are all kinds of dichotomies that's a part of the story of energy democracy. And of course, as every good novel has, it has a climax. It has an ending. And I think that's where I want to start today. I want to start with the end of the book. You know how you used to go do book reports in college and you always would go to the end and figure out how it ended and then if you had time, you'd read the other chapters? Well, we're going to go to the end of the book, um, get to the climax. And the climax is this. We're going to win. Can I say that again? We're going to win, all right? We will. We will dismantle the fossil fuel economy, and we will replace it with a generative economy, a sustainable, a just, and an inclusive economy, because we are building a movement, a global movement, with the resolve, with the resources to transform the extractive economy to the generative economy. But, but, to get there is not easy, right? The, the book suggests that we have to build this movement and to give it more of a hint, to give you more of a hint of how this book ends. We suggest that this movement takes on the qualities and the characteristics of the abolitionist movement and what it took to dismantle the slave economy is what, in fact, we're suggesting is going to be needed to build an energy democracy future. So. Where's my little pointer? Um, so what the power of this book is, um, it, it, it was, first of all, a labor of love. I have to say this, because uh, we brought several things together. One was uh, non-traditional voices. Right? This book uh, talks about non-traditional voices that you typically don't hear in terms of being an environmentalist. Secondly, it presents sort of an intersectional framework of understanding issues of carbon. And, and climate change, and it also presents a sense of urgency, but at the same time a sense of efficacy, the sense of the possibilities, and it's being done by looking at what folks are doing around the country. All right, so I'm going to be brief, and I'm going to give you a highlight of, of some of these themes um, and some of these uh, elements of the book. Um, sorry. To know all of this. So just to talk about the non-traditional voices, the Energy Democracy book is really about the energy future as, as seen, experienced, as envisioned by and driven by and defined by everyday people, not politicians, not environmentalists, not industry professionals, but everyday folks. The authors and fr our frontline grassroots communities and residents that are bringing their lived experiences into the understanding and the planning of a new clean economy. Now this, as I said, is the first miracle is to try and take these activists and get them to sit down and write. Oh my God, talk about harnessing cats. But um, it, they did that. And the, the, the book delivers stories, narratives from voices of uh, rural Mississippi. And we'll hear, I'll tell you some of uh, what's going on in uh, black, the black rural South in terms of their effort to reclaim energy co-ops. We have folks in the API community from um, uh, immigrant communities, limited English speaking communities that are part of this book telling their story from their perspective about why energy democracy matters from their lived experiences. We have labor unions who are um, engaged in this struggle. It's in a very difficult struggle for labor unions to figure out how to um, engage in this notion of, of energy democracy. We have uh, stories of, of high school youth and how they're taking power into their own hands and seeing this as a question of their future, if nobody else's future. This is an intergenerational 
uh, movement that's being built here. We have the middle class moms who are understanding this from their, their health perspective and their children's perspective when they're going to hospitals with asthma cases and what have you. So we have uh, an amazing array of, of voices that are coming out in this book that are understanding this. These, we call them sort of a reluctant environmentalists. <laughs> they're environmentalists only because they've been confronted with environmental challenges and are taking it on as something that has to do with their basic needs and, and their overall livelihood. So these are uh, important non-traditional uh, voices and um, they each are challenged um, and or inspired all right, differently. Um, they have constructed different approaches towards an energy democracy future. There is no cookie cutter notion about how you do it. It's all contextual. It's all based on what the needs and challenges and opportunities are in each community. Um, each story stands alone and provides insights into pathways that are leading these environmental, these non-traditional voices to join the larger movement for environmental and jo uh, social justice. Um, so the intersectional framework is also uh, an important contribution to the energy democracy story. Um, because what's happened is that as we take these non-traditional voices and they talk about their lived experiences, clearly they see things in a different kind of way and they have a different approach to their solutions. They are addressing the intersections of, of energy uh, as it relates to income inequality and poverty, as it relates to health disparities, as it relates to immigration, and clearly, let me tell you, immigration is going to be a, a, key, a key issue going forward with climate change as we see climate refugees moving and migrating from conditions of drought or lack of food. And that's not just, you know, international immigration, but it's going to be from, you know, coastal communities or, or, or communities where there are wildfires and that have been burnt out that are now moving to other parts of uh, the United States. So the question of migration and immigration is wrapped up into the notion of energy and the sources of energy and how we use and distribute energy. And clearly, uh, they see the, the nexus between um, the, sort of the notion of carbon and democracy and who owns and who controls the energy resources. Uh, these are the intersectional issues that, that are being addressed. And clearly, for example, you cannot, from the energy democracy framework, see 100% renewable that does not address the concentration of power, literally and figuratively, in the hands of a few, uh, to the exclusion of Main Street as being sufficient in an energy democracy framework. The privatization of solar, wind, and other renewables, rather than seeing it as part of the commons, is not how we see energy democracy. 100% renewable that in fact uh, focuses on its exchange value or its economic value as opposed to how it's used and meets people's basic needs is not a part of the energy democracy agenda. If we look at carbon reduction that does not prioritize the elimination of hotspots in concentrated areas of, po of pollution and poverty, that is not an energy uh, democracy framework. So many of you really understand this picture here. You understand uh, the carbon climate nexus. You understand what it means in terms of the loss of biodiversity. You understand what it means in terms of the parts per million where we have far exceeded. You know, we're past 350 parts per million of carbon. We're past 400, right? So we understand what it's going to do to sea level rises. You understand what it's actually going to do for uh, extreme weather conditions where we have seen 42 $1 billion uh, disaster events, 1 billion each of these events every year, not, with, not even counting what's happened this, this past fall. So you understand the sort of the environmental dimensions of this uh, climate change and, and what we're experiencing. Um, and, and if you just look at just those environmental impacts, the climate impacts, then this is your solution. Your solution is a clean energy revolution. And in fact, that is a big movement that's taking place right now. People are talking about 100% renewable. And that used to seem outlandish. It seemed far-fetched. It seemed like, oh, we will never be 100% renewable. But it is becoming sort of the common uh, framework for people to understand what the goal is, where the mission is going forward. 
But that clean energy revolution is um, not looking at the convergence factors. It's not looking at all those things we just talked about, that we uh, have a polluted earth and that the pollution, uh, in fact, is rooted in many other things. If we do not address our cultural values, all right, if we do not address that this environmental problem is rooted in our economy, then we are not fixing. There will be no technological fixes for climate change. That we are valuing the fact that more is better, right? The bigger my house, the more cars that I have, the more clothes that I have, the better, more expensive they are. That we're in a world where consumption, mass production and mass consumption is the way that we live. And that economy is fueled by what? The source of energy has been fossil fuels. But to the extent that we even trans substitute clean energy for dirty energy, and we don't fix this, then we are out of balance with the ecosystem. That we have not learned how to align the human species in, the in, in a very interrelated ecosystem. And that's why we're out of balance right now because we have been in an extractive economy that wants to exploit for the benefit of profit, for the benefit of a few, to not understand that is putting us out of balance to the things that we need to survive, the water, our food supply, and the rest of that. So the notion of energy democracy really, really gets to um, some new environmental imperatives. Um, it really addresses the fact that um, we are um, it, it sort of goes back to indigenous cultures and, and the voices that you hear in the books and First Nation uh, societies and other traditional cultures are really talking about uh, the new, richer environmental ethos where it's a return and a respect to our indigenous values and ways of living um, outside of the Western culture. There was a time, if you know, in, in many traditional cultures that there was a respect and even a fear of nature you know, often enforced by taboos or even rituals uh, and ceremonies. And we've, you know, and some societies still engage in that. And, and it was also often called animism. It was decided or that it was, you know, very um, too native and, and, and not grounded in science. Well, the fact is that folks understood that there were certain days and certain ways that they used water and certain, you know, trees that they didn't cut down, and you know when and how they fished, all of that was to recognize that we were one in nature. Um, how, do, how do we go there? And this is, this is a really deep uh, sort of understanding about, you know, people talk about reparations and, and the loss, for, for example, of African Americans and slavery and how we need reparations. I think more than anything else, whether more than monetary reparations, it's a cultural reparation, to be able to return to values that understand where we are as, as part of, a, of an ecosystem. So um, our movement towards energy democracy, uh, our notion of transformation must also begin to reimagine, rethink, re-engineer our relationship to the environment. The natural endowments should not be owned by, belong to anyone or anybody that um, uses energy, that doesn't use energy for the, for the common good that there needs to be a value and a view of energy as part of the commons, like we view and understand and treat the high seas or how we view and treat um, at the atmosphere. There are laws that suggest how we use the high seas and the inner and outer orbit in, in a communal way with our global citizens. So we need to begin to think of energy in a similar kind of way, that energy is valued not just for its, its use, that is valued for its use and not just for uh, how much money is going to make a select number of people. So these are important uh, perceptions that the book advances, it talks about, um, and it really does it. Uh, Cecilia Martinez, who, who's First Nation, she talks about it from her perspective and, and how, we, how they see the decisions that they make as being decisions based on seven generations, right? So they don't make decisions based on here and now and what we need, but two generations in the past, the current generation in which we live, and um, several generations going forward. 
and how we understand ourselves um, in that context so that we are not consuming resources that's gonna deprive the next generation and our children and our, and our grandchildren. So that's a part of the environmental framework. And in addition to that, aligning with folks in the global south who actually have a, a sort of a frame, a mandate that says that the environment has a right to regenerate, that there, there are rights to the environment. And there is a movement, there is a global movement that says that the environment has a right. And how do we respect and honor that right? So those are some of the sort of uh, underpinnings, the philosophical values and principles um, as the folks in this book uh, talk about environment in a different kind of way, a different kind of sensibilities. But there are also new um, economic uh, values and principles and imperatives that, that are also advanced in this book. And, and we talked about it a little bit, but it really is to understand that our economy is an extractive economy and that we're moving towards a more generative, sustainable, just and inclusive economy. And that this is changing how we see uh, society as being about mass production, mass consumption, um, and mass accumulation of wealth. That we're building an economy that is communal, that is cooperative, um, and that addresses other racial and social justice issue, that is a caring and a moral economy. Um, co-ops are key to this. There are a lot of stories that talk about co-op development and, and how you know, co-ops are built from the ground and, and what it means for not only the environment, but how, what it means for interrelationships with, with uh, people and, and the community at large. And then, and then the book really hits on the question of equity. And it's a real huge issue when it comes to low-income communities of color. Uh, the equity issues are at a number of different levels. When you look at inner city communities that have been divested in for decades, 50, 60, 70 years, um, where the community infrastructure is uh, weak. If you look at what happened to Katrina and the broken levees, it wasn't the hurricanes that destroyed uh, this community with the, with the weakened and broken levees. When you look at our co now other communities where our sewers are backed up and so floods, you know, you get a good rain in South LA, honey, you need to pull your rowboats out, okay? It's, it's that bad. Um, how do we begin when you talk about weatherization of buildings and you don't have roofs that could withstand, you know, a, a solar panel or energy efficiency and trying to change, you know, the electrical infrastructure when you know, you're, you're dealing with old electrical infrastructure and without the resources to fix this. This is the kind of equity issue that has to be addressed when you think about moving to a clean energy economy using new technologies and, and communities that have, uh, don't have the infrastructure to support this. The equity challenge also has to do with the health impacts. The bottom line is that um, communities of color are live uh, in toxic communities. You know, I don't, I don't know about you guys, but somebody was asking me where I grew up. I, I grew up in, born in Bed-Stuy, but I grew up in Queens, and I remember. And you know, you don't understand this until 20, 30, 40 years later. I would walk to school, and we would always be told, you know, not to go through the coal yard. There was a coal yard along the Long Island Railroad, and we loved to go down through the coal yard. I mean, that was like the thing to do. And in fact, it would be, you know, the last day of school, everyone would go through the coal yard because we would throw coal at each other, you know, and do raucous and whatever. Who knew, right? Who knew? I mean, but this, is, this, is, this was our neighborhood. And who knew? And to this day, I don't know what the health effects are. But every, most 60% of black and Latino uh, folks live in toxic communities, whether it has to do with uh, the, the, the freeways or whether it has to do with the factories, um, whether it has to do with whether there's a refinery in their communities, um, they live with this and it, the impacts are significant because there's the disproportionate amount of asthma in, the, in these communities, right, where the emergency room on Friday night with repeated um, cases of asthma constantly impacts the, the health and well-being of our communities. Uh, and these are places without health insurance, uh, without air conditioning. A lot of these communities are hot spots where it's projected in California, for example, that the temperatures will rise to you know, 10 degrees. And it is hot. My house, I live in a 1904 house, 
and it used to be one week out of the year that we might have 90 degrees. Now it's turned into like five, six, seven weeks out of the year in Los Angeles, and the place is suffocating. Well, you know, folks can't afford um, air conditioning. You've got older, elderly, weak, you know, sick, sick people who have heat strokes as a, as a byproduct of that, um, a, a real challenge. We talk about these hot spots, and I mentioned earlier in our, our conversation, we're asphalt, we're urban jungles, we're asphalt jungles. You know, we don't have canopies, you know, tree canopies to cool out our neighborhoods. Um, and we, we were told by the police that they did not want canopies in our neighborhoods because it would interfere with police surveillance, <laughs> and a crime prevention. Um, but they'd rather, you know, kill us one, one way or another, I guess. It's hard to figure this out. And, you know, one of the interesting things, it's just the irony in some ways about the intersection of, of carbon and, and sort of these larger movements like uh, Black Lives Matter uh, came to me when two weeks ago we heard that um, Erica Garner passed away. I don't know if you know who Erica Garner is. She was the daughter of Eric, um, Eric Garner who was killed by police um, in, in Staten Island you know, the I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Well, he died of asthma, and she died of asthma as well. And I can't help but think, you know, of the irony between, you know, climate change and carbon emissions and people's struggle uh, for, um, uh, against police brutality and, and the understanding of Black Lives Matter and, and poverty. These things are, are actually connected, but you don't, you don't get it, you don't see it unless you you actually live the experience. So we, we live, we, we've got health, uh, the equity challenge with relates to, to the economy with respect to health. Um, the economic inequities are also clear in a number of different ways. On the one hand, low-income communities of color use um, energy less than anyone else. All right, if you think about um, um, you know, some of the large you know, man McMansions that you have out and people turning on lights and using you know, sprinklers or whatever. Low-income folks use energy less, but they pay more. We pay you know, uh, substantially a disproportionate amount of our income, uh, of our household budget, 12 to 13 percent, goes to utility bills versus the average community where it's you know, five or six and seven percent. So what's, there, there's clear inequity in that regard. Um, we are also a community that will actually suffer more when we move to clean energy, because we work in um, industries that are at risk of job loss. We work in the agricultural sector. And so as we see you know, where we're losing aquifers and where the agricultural sector is, is dying in many instances, where, where are the jobs going, right? Or we work in factories. What do we do about jobs? And even when people are moving out of the coal industry and out of the utility sector into clean energy, there's a whole chapter that really talks about just transition. How do we do this in a way that really recognizes that people work, they need work, they need ways to support their families? And are we gonna build an industry that doesn't in fact uh, support uh, labor unions and, and wages and career, trajectories, and what do we do to make sure that people can make a just transition into a clean economy when they're really most vulnerable in terms of loss of, of, uh, of jobs and opportunities. And there's also the, the whole issue of uh, economic inequities when you talk about the rising costs of everything. When you start thinking about food prices going up, right, when you have drought and you have farm conditions that are not as productive as it used to be, you know, supply and demand things will be more expensive. Low-income folks are gonna have a harder time uh, meeting the cost of feeding their family. Or, you know, when it comes to even energy, you know, the utility bills, you keep looking at utility bill every year, it goes up higher and higher and higher. How do we address these issues in the context of um, communities of color and low-income communities? And these are the kinds of conversations that are happening in this Energy Democracy book. So these are uh, important issues, the intersection of energy with health and, and poverty. Um, and the important thing is to recognize, though, that, um, talk about the built environment. Oh, the, the last thing is about the social and cultural infrastructure. Besides our economic infrastructure, our, our physical infrastructure, we're an overburdened community already. You know, when folks are asking for people of color to come out to, to meetings, uh, 
uh, to deal with climate change, environmental issues, when we are already living a legacy of unmitigated disasters, you know, that have yet to be resolved. You know, we're still trying to figure out the job thing. Oh, oh, that's already my number one crisis, my number one disaster is the lack of jobs. It's the lack of good education for my children. It's the lack of health care. It is, you know, the disaster down the street in terms of uh, drugs and crime. It is, you know, an overburdened civic infrastructure. So when you think about energy and energy revolution and engaging low-income communities, how do you address the overburdened civic infrastructure, the, the, uh, the, the fact that many communities are isolated linguistically? You know, this cannot be just English-only kind of engagement. We've got to engage everyone of every language, every culture, and every community in this new envisioning and re-engineering uh, of America. So. Um, the good part about all of this is that there is hope, you know, and the stories that are in this book is about how to actually go from the problem to the solution. Uh, and there's the story about building leadership. And at the core, that is probably what is, runs through all of the narratives that are being told, that people are, uh, you have to organize, you have to bring folks out to really understand what that plug means, you know? What, what goes into that plug? Usually you just put in your iPhone and that's all you know. With little knowledge or information or wherewithal to understand what's going into that plug and what's coming out to that plug and how it's actually affecting your day-to-day -day life. So you, you see uh, the work of the Asian Pacific uh, Environmental Network in, in California. You see the work of the Climate Justice Alliance that's all around the United States, including uh, con um, Kentuckians for the Commonwealth that are working in a, in a coal environment, a coal country, and, and finding just transition strategies to get coal miners into renewable energy in the process of organizing and educating and creating leadership um, in these communities. You see uh, the Black, Black Mesa in Arizona, Black Mesa for Water Coalition, where they're really uh, they were actually providing coal to California, and they were able to shut down the coal plant in California, and they're still now struggling to get um, the sort of the, the reparations and the resources from that, that stranded mm -hmm. asset. Uh, so organizing communities and, and training and educating them. There's an amazing story, the, sort of one of the best stories I, I like in the book is about what's happening in rural Mississippi. If you rec remember in the, how many of you remember the 1930s? <laughs> okay, uh, I don't either. So in the 1930s, uh, the rural electrification program under Franklin Roosevelt electrified rural communities. And they were organized as cooperatives. They do not function as cooperatives. They are not community owned and community controlled utilities. They are just, uh, they look like, smell like, and act like your investor owned utilities. So what one voice, they have 33 rural co-ops in Mississippi, and one voice is a, a program of the NAACP started knocking on doors, door to door and saying, do you know you own an energy company? <laughs> and people are like, what? And they brought them out and are teach, and, and teaching them how to reclaim these energy companies. And let me tell you why it's important, because those energy companies are not serving their best interests. They're still um, burning coal, you know, in these rural communities. They are not giving di getting dividends, and these are extremely profitable cooperatives. Worse yet is that those dividends are actually going to support conservative political candidates who are then not serving the interests of the communities that they are supposed to represent. Uh, and so they're learning these hard things about what is a rural co-op, um, what, are the, what do these bylaws mean? And beginning to run um, candidates from these communities to serve on the board because they are not represented. Uh, the, the demographics of the community is not rep represented on this board. So this is a, a major educational program. You know how people, you know, you get these utility notices. If you, you're an investor in something, is gobbledygook. It looks like something that you immediately trash. They're beginning to read it. These are proxies, they're getting proxy statements, they're reading it, they're understanding what it means, and they're acting on it. So these are some of the, um, the, the efforts that are, that are taking place in um, the energy democracy 
a, a field. Folks are doing some, some planning um, and, and hard work about how you fight the power. <laughs> this has, what this is, is how you fight the fossil fuel industry. You have Richmond, California. You have communities that are sitting in the face of Chevron, you know, and I don't know if you've ever been there, but, you know, people are in the hospitals all the time for rashes and all kinds of effects because the, the pollution is, is just imminent. And so they're planning to figure out how to shut down Chevron or otherwise get them to be responsible uh, citizens um, and, and teaching folks how to, how to engage in um, working towards solutions. And one of the most important part of this work is, Keith, I don't know if you recognize some of these people. Uh, <laughs> right, right. Um, civic engagement, that, 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 that our communities need to organize themselves and engage um, around issues that we understand that are very unique to us. But I think the sort of the driver of, of Emerald Cities, what we've tried to do is to cross those tables, is to cross the divide. That we, we sit down with labor, and we sit down with community, and we sit down with energy companies, and we try and figure out, you know, the, the sort of the, the common uh, agenda to go forward to make our society um, and our energy future better for, for all of us. Um, organizing is key to um, all of this work. Uh, one of the things that um, is happening with a, a story in the book is about the local Clean Energy Alliance and what they're doing around community choice aggregation. I don't know, does anybody know what that is? It's a state law, it's a state law enabling legislation. It's in seven states, California is one, which fundamentally, if the residents um, agree and vote for it, uh, municipalities, the municipalization of investor-owned utilities, where uh, the government then becomes your utility. Uh, they project, so California is a, a community choice state. They're projecting that 60% of all energy services will be run by municipalities um, in the next five years. PG&E, Southern uh, San Diego, Gas and Electric, the Southern California gas folk, they freaking out. <laughs> they are freaking out. There's a piece of legislation that just popped right over Christmas um, through the Public Utilities Commission to stop, cease and desist, cease and desist community choice aggregation because it's putting power into the hands of the people that, you know, with government that's more accountable to the outcomes. We can make a choice about what kind of energy sources we want, how we're going to put out distributive energy and what communities it goes into first, uh, and they are putting a stop to it. So Local Clean Energy Alliance is doing this work um, in the Alameda County area, uh, East Bay, San Francisco, an amazing coalition of labor and communities, and they're fighting it out. There's no question these are not easy issues about jobs and health and as well as the environment, but they're fighting it out in a way that I think really puts community in community choice. Now, we have about 10 community choice programs right now being developed. Los Angeles is one that does not put community and community choice. You might as well say they're an investor-owned utility because they're operating the same kind of way. And the community is saying, oh, no, 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 no. We got a stake in this. Labor unions are saying we got a stake in this. Community is saying where are the jobs? Where are the non-energy benefits? Um, so these are some of the stories that you actually will be hearing about the uh, monopoly power grab. Because one of the things we do not want to do, we don't want to take um, renewable energy and give it to the same old folks that have had energy in the past, all right? This is the time. This is, we're, we're not going to see an energy revolution like this for another 100 years. It is, fund, the energy sector is fundamentally changing. And the question is, what kind of sector is that going to be? Who's going to own? Who's going to control, control? Who's going to benefit from this new clean energy future? This is the engagement that we are, are seeing around um, the organizing, the mobilizing work, clearly, you know, people are into the resistance, you know, which is, you know, stop Keystone and stop these other pipelines, which we're fighting with, you know, some of our labor friends, but realizing, you know, um, what, what sacrifices are being made on sovereign land and sensitive land, you know, ecologically sensitive land. Um, and 
is there an alternative where we can achieve the goals of environment, economy, and equity? And uh, folks are changing policies, you know, uh, stories about how grassroots folks, first they just wanted, I just want a solar panel. One neighbor started talking to the next neighbor, co-op power, the story of co-op power. Um, the next, and the next neighbor, and nobody knew sort of the complexities of getting a solar panel. And as they started having meetings and getting together in a room just like this, they started learning from each other. Oh, you go find out and you talk to the city council and what is this renewable portfolio standard thing? What, what is that? And they started learning the language and the process and became um, empowered. This notion of organizing a, a, a co-op, solo co-op, became a political movement where they began to change policies within the DC, this is DC, uh, DC City Council, to increase their renewable portfolio standards, which means that they have to buy more of their utility from renewable sources. Um, they changed other rules that were making it hard for communities to actually be a part of this clean energy future. This coalition that actually started in my neighborhood, Mount Pleasant, Washington, uh, the Mount Pleasant neighborhood has now grown into a regional movement, and now they're going to other states to actually do group purchasing of, of co-op power so that neighbors can be a part of this movement and learn from each other about what that process entails. So we're building solar, we're building solar on roofs, but we're also a part of energy democracy, wanting to make sure that these investments are growing to critical facilities, that if we're not working to help affordable housing communities, people that live in low-income housing, or people that live in public housing to be a part of this future, you are not talking about energy democracy. This is, and this is what the utilities are saying. They're saying to the Public Utilities Commission, oh, this is just a middle-class white thing. You know, that this, this is gonna leave out poor folk and people of color. And so they're really trying to get to black and brown legislators and letting them know that, you know, that they're gonna screw your folks. Well, we've got to show them that is not the case. You know, the numbers show, the research shows that people of color care about a clean energy future greater than the average white American community. We have just had a hard time getting investments in our community for a variety of reasons. Number one, working in the affordable housing sector is very complicated. Ask our team here in Seattle. They're working in the affordable housing community. These are low-income folks that need it. First of all, they don't own their house, right? So it's hard for them to say, give me solar. Um, secondly, those that own the house, the nonprofit development community, you know, I don't know if you've ever done affordable housing. I used to do this for six years. They're like six, seven, eight layers of financing just to build the house. Now you're going to tell me to unpack that capital stack to do a $200,000 retrofit? Oh, no, no, I don't want you touching my mortgages. I don't want you looking and messing with my finances. So it becomes very, very challenging to do these affordable housing deals, but Steve figured it out. You all are doing it in Seattle and actually leading the way in the country about how to structure this in partnership with uh, the public and private sector, the Washington State Housing Finance Agency, Seattle City Lights, um, for-profit for developers, uh, the Community Foundation. And you have to also, besides looking at the most vulnerable populations in affordable housing, you've got to make an investment in the public housing sector. When we look at climate change and what happens with extreme weather conditions, public housing is always the last to get back up and running. It was the last um, to get lights turned back on after Superstorm Sandy. Um, in Puerto Rico, I think they said they lost 3,000 units of public housing. Where is that coming from? Where, where, how do we rebuild this? So how do we use um, and address this in our public housing sector? There's a story in the book that really is about what's happening in the Bronx and how they're working with the Public Housing Authority and several ESCOs that are uh, gotten money from the public, NYCHA, uh, to retrofit those buildings, and they're uh, engaged the community groups to work and talk to the residents about energy, energy conservation, and to create energy uh, job opportunities um, as a part of that investment that's taking place. So there is an important targeting that has to take place for these uh, communities. We talked about the energy co-op. There's several stories about how you begin to build this how-to manual energy co-ops. 
Um, the anchor institution strategies are critical. Our, our hospitals, our universities, our, and our churches are important partners with community groups to take resources. They have huge financial capital. They have huge real estate that could be used for community energy grids. Um, and they have huge political capital that could be used towards building a, a strategic vision around energy democracy. And we're seeing that around the country. One of the things, as I said, the real estate, the footprint on these colleges and universities are large enough so that you can really think about building um, community solar projects, where if you don't own your home, you can plug into a community solar um, uh, dist distribution uh, channel. So um, jobs are key. Y'all recognize anything in that? Got green. Um, so, you know, what, whatever investments we are saying, I mean, uh, people of color own, are participating in the utility sector right now. There's about 7% of all jobs, current fossil fuel jobs, going to people of color. If we're going to build a new clean economy, that is unacceptable. We must make sure that we're building job opportunities and training the future uh, to be a part of this new clean energy future. We've got to work with minority women, uh, disadvantaged and veteran owned businesses to participate in um, retrofitting the buildings, putting in solar, being a part of rebuilding, re-engineering um, America. Uh, and we have to build community resilience, working with young people um, to really understand everything from get out your cars. In fact, I mentioned earlier about how the millennials are great because nobody really wants cars. The millennials are like, a car? What's a car? So um, they, they are the future. They're thinking that nobody wants a house. Nobody wants, you know, all the things that we wanted. The millennials are really re-examining um, our assumptions and our values in a new way that's really uh, pretty important. Local food production um, is also key. Food is the third largest generator of greenhouse gas um, outside of buildings and, and mobile sources. So um, that's also part of what we're doing. So I'm going to pretty much end there. I would say that it's important for us to recognize that, well, let, let me just you know, say a, a couple of other things. Um, these are important projects in and of themselves. They're really uh, important. They're milestones towards energy democracy future. These local struggles are important um, ingredients in this long arc towards justice. But let's be clear that it is not, it is not enough, these one-offs. The plot to overturn the bad guys, the entrenched corporate interests, really involves organizing a bigger, stronger movement beyond the environmental movement. It requires us to align with other racial, uh, social, and economic justice allies. Um, and I can conclude this chapter as I started with what it took to dismantle the slave economy. And some of the things that we have to think about is that um, it really requires us addressing issues of profit, property, power, and privilege. All right? That's what we're trying to dismantle when we talk about this work. Um, it really requires us to build a uh, moral message that gets to everybody's sense of justice and what's right. You know, it used to be in the slave economy, it was about, it was a human right. It was a civil right. It was just the moral thing to do, to not own slaves. We have to also create a moral imperative in a sim similar kind of way about what it means to have property rights and, and to extract uh, our natural resources this, this new movement has to have a big tent. It has to be multi-ethnic, right? It has to be multi-sector. No one organization can build this movement to overcome the power dynamics that we're dealing with this fossil fuel industry. You see what they're doing now in the context of this administration. So everyone needs to step up. We need the lawyers. We need the business community, the financial community. We need the preachers. We need you to be a part of this, this larger movement. We, we need martyrs, right? We need uh, people willing to resist, 
to stand up against the status quo, to stand up for justice and speak truth to power. We have to um, lead this movement. It must be led by people most impacted by this dirty energy economy. We have to hear the voices of communities, low-income communities and communities of color because their sensibilities about how to build a new world, a world in which everyone is a part of, that it deals with environment, economy, and justice is an important voice that is underplayed in this movement building. We have to have global alliances. We have to think about legal and constitutional challenges. We overturned slavery through the 13th Amendment because it was okay in the Constitution to own slaves. It's okay in the Constitution, you know, three key clauses in the Constitution, it says it's okay to own property um, and not to use property for uh, the common good. Um, and it requires us to really build what we call epistemic communities, what we showed, us coming together and seeing that we are all in the same boat and if we don't start rowing in the same direction, we will all sink. So that's what a transformative movement takes. That's what we're sort of suggesting in this book through examples, through values, through principles, through um, a, a construct that we think is uh, kind of unique to the conversation. And no matter where you sit in civil society, no matter what you're doing in your world of work and commerce, uh, you need to be a part of this. And I think the state of Washington has been a leader in this regard. Um, and you have the power of emulation, if nothing else, the power to show the alternative. Because in addition to fighting the bad guys, we have to show what it is to live large on less. We have to show what kind of policies really will make a difference. We have to show what kind of diversity in the leadership structure really matters. So you need to live as a blue state with a great, what I understand at dinner, a great mayor and a great governor. You have the power of emulation to show others that it's okay, that we can do this and it may be challenged we, we won't have a civil war over it. I don't think we'll have a civil war over it, even though we're fighting the civil war now, um, again, um, that, that we can win and that we will win when everyone joins hands to create a, a society worth living in. Thank you very much. What, the last thing I, I just want to mention to you, if I have that slide up here. Um, no. So not everyone, we're going to be issuing a energy democracy scorecard um, soon. It wasn't timely enough for our very first uh, meeting here to really figure out where, so you can self-evaluate where you are on the energy democracy spectrum. Because, you know, being over to, well, I want to say the far left. Okay, being over to the far left is, you know, it, not everyone is there. Uh, and it'll take a while to get there. But to know where that far left is and where you are in terms of policies and programs um, is an important part of determining if, we're, if you're going to be moving the needle. So at some point in time, uh, we will share with you, because there are different metrics, there are, uh, how to evaluate success, there are different sources of energy, there's different role for communities, and being able to understand that is something that we want to share with you and give with you uh, in this community to do this self-evaluation, to move closer and closer over the next decade um, to an uh, energy democracy state. I've never heard anyone speak about this like you have. And energy is an emotional issue. It's an emotional issue, <clears throat> and it's about the community. Three or four years ago, I was watching a, a program about Afghanistan and Iraq. My window was open. I was sobbing, saying they're killing these soldiers for oil. Soldiers are, being, are dying because our country believes in oil. It believes in weapons, and it believes in oil. And we all have to accept that. Every time you get in your car, you're supporting the oil industry. And bringing up the idea of environmental rights blows me away. Our environment has rights. We owe something to the environment. And I'm very glad you brought that up. Also, folks under the age of 25 are the future 
of making this change because they don't want to have a car. They don't, they believe in the environmental movement. I have friends who put solar on their roof. They are not tree huggers. They are not tree huggers. They're practical. It used to be kind of, you know, you, you point to some hippie and say, oh, he's just a tree hugger, you know, but I don't, I don't take him seriously. We have to take people seriously who do not believe in some kind of cloud, you know, pie, some crazy idea that if you are, there's something wrong with you, if you're environmentally conscious, we have to change that, and that will change our energy future. That has to happen. Thank you. I think you're terrific. Thank you, sir. <laughs>
you can only be successful if you can measure something. You can only put a plan together if you can measure something. And so one of the things that I'm kind of curious about, and you mentioned this before, is uh, concepts of hotspots, pollution hotspots among uh, communities of color, and also the tree canopies, and that is that as well is something. Both items which you know communities of color are um, disadvantaged by. disadvantaged from. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the question is 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 on those metrics the, those metrics, right? Um, do you see any uh, communities in the nation that are using those metrics to actually make policy and actually move forward and say five years from now we are going to have more tree canopy in these neighborhoods 10 years from now? Or, or is it one of those things that we're, we're just kind of saying, yeah, this is a problem, but we're kind of ignoring it and we're saying, well, it's going to solve itself. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess the, the follow-on question to that is, is there things that can be done to institutionalize those types of, of, of um, evaluations to where you actually are making some progress as opposed to just saying, yeah, there's a problem. And I'll have a follow. I'll have a follow up on this after the I'm answer sure too. You have. Um, <laughs> so yes, um, there is. I know, for example, Los Angeles. There was the Million Tree Initiative, and that's where we know about where the police freaked out and and said, "Oh no, oh, no, yeah, you know, this is going to get in the way of my job of finding criminals." So there are cities that have, and there's several other cities that have the Million Tree Initiative, and they're using youth organizations like uh, the Conservation Corps and and youth build and others to do these tree plantings. It's become a big issue that once you plant them, then who's gonna maintain them? You know, so there are real challenges and I planted, had a couple planted in my neighborhood and they died. So, you know, how you replace them. But there is, there is that. There is uh, the Cool Roofs Initiative uh, in many, many uh, cities and states around the country where there are incentives for folks to actually put um, gardens, urban gardens on roofs, you know, which is also, you know, it's part of the food, you know, production, but it's also cooling, you know, the house because of the um, efforts. And so there are policies, there are uh, cool roof policies around uh, the country to begin to do that. Yeah, so I think, I think to get back to my follow-up question here was, it's more of a question is, are there measuring at the state, at the city level, and are they taking action? So if the trees are dying, that's an indication that there's not resources being put in place and there should be somebody asking for the city for accountability, you know, not just saying, well, we planted trees and now the problem's solved. Right, right. So it's a follow-on question of that. And I guess the, the next, the follow-on question which I want to ask on top of that is what metrics are you going to have for, democracy, for energy democracy to say we're making progress? So maybe that, I'll close it with that and yeah. maybe ask. So, you know, that. one of the best indices or uh, the, um, online system to evaluate the particularly energy democracy, is the Cal Enviro Index, where the entire state of California, based uh, at the census track level, you can track the level of poverty, um, the health status, um, the level of greenhouse gas and carbon emissions to really determine, and the redder it is, the more it's impacted by, you know, environment, economy, health, and so forth. So it's a really amazing planning tool. I think it came out of uh, Manuel, Manuel Pastor's work in, in, uh, at USC. So it's an index that, and I think the, uh, the state EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency for the state of California, adopted it and is making it uh, useful in, in a lot of their you know, grant making and, mm -hmm. and resource allocation. And I think the uh, EPA in Washington is beginning to look at this as well on a national level. One of the things that I think is worth emphasizing, which you alluded to at the beginning, and I think it could be emphasized further, is that um, capitalism is based, is by its very nature, based on uh, unsustainable growth. It is, requires growth because based on competition, each individual corporation, a company, uh, has to find ways to make their products cheaper, to sell more products, to increase their profit, because if they don't do it, their competitor will do it and may turn around and put them out of business. Mm -hmm. So that model becomes, uh, it's totally antithetical to a sustainable uh, environment and a sustainable society. Absolutely. And f on top of that is the issue of automation because they will find ways to reduce cost and put people out of business, uh, put people out of work. And what that does is, in, in capitalism, there's no solution for that. But in a, lot, in a sustainable society, 
what we could do is, if we put people out of work, we could still pay them and have, give them more leisure time. And so the concept would be, instead of having, instead of having a, an economy based on having, which is that picture of the fellow carrying all those packages, although I don't know if it was a fellow, but a person carrying all those packages, instead of a, an economy based on, and a society based on having, we have a, have a society based on being, where the, the, the point of living is not just to have things, but the point of living is to be and create, et cetera. And I liked your thoughts on that. Uh, I absolutely agree. We, we have an economy that's about as unsustainable and unjust. Um, and I don't think it's serving anyone well whatsoever. And the way that I'm seeing the world is that people want what you suggest, a quality of life. No, and that quality of life is not driven by materialism. See, we are complicit in capitalism because we go shopping, <laughs> we buy the cars, we are, and so as consumers, what is our responsibility? If we don't buy, they can't sell. Now, of course, they're trying to sell on internet and TV and radio and billboards and whatever, so it's, you know, you, there's this hunger to get new stuff, but I think there is some responsibility as individuals to change the market. We can change the market as, as opposed to responding to the market. Um, there's something else you were saying, but those are my basic. I just wanted to make one that when after 9-11, uh, George W. Bush said, go out and shop. <laughs> well, you know, the other thing, I mean, I, I'm, just, I'm just giving giving my hopes to the millennials to sort of show a new kind of way. I mentioned earlier about uh, two Christmases ago, my son gave me a book, you know, how to, um, on a four hour work week. <laughs> I don't know if you've read that, a four hour work week. It says, mom, you should, be, you should be reading this, you know, and why do you guys have to wait to 65 to, to start living your life? You know, and, and so people are beginning to understand is that you can work a year and take off a year. And I, in fact, I hadn't even heard of this. What do these kids take now? A uh, year off, what do they call that? A gap year. Who ever heard of that, right? <laughs> no, it's called a work year. There's no gap year. Um, but they're beginning to understand being, your, your point about how to be, how to live, how to make money and support themselves, but, you know, not trying to live you know, in big houses with lots of cars because they're not buying houses and they're not buying cars. So it's a different kind of sensibility and I'd love to figure out how to support that um, and how I can get to a four hour work week. So I'm writing my thesis on solar cooperatives and I'm wondering what are some of the best financing structures that you've seen. Uh, oh girl, that's that too much for too late. <laughs> Um, just in terms especially of low income households and I know it's a complex question. Yeah, it's, 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 I have to say, first of all, there are very few good um, financial models or people that understand how to finance uh, co-ops. You know, there's one, there are two people that I probably know about, and they are struggling. They said, if I am the best, we are in bad shape, okay? But um, there are lease purchase um, structures that are, that are being uh, employed. But one of the best things that you'll find in the book is that people are just lowering the price of purchasing through group, group purchasing options. And so, you know, they are able to negotiate with contractors a better price because they've got 15 neighbors or 20 neighbors or 50 neighbors that are willing to do this, you know, as a, as a consortium, as a, as a community that makes it a little bit more affordable. So, um, but that's, you know, some of the ideas you might look at. Great, thanks. thanks. Hey, I'm Justin. How's it going? Good. You get the last question, so don't make it hard. Woo! I think it's <laughs> relative softball. I don't know. Okay. Anyway, you mentioned something that I thought was kind of radical earlier, which is questioning basically land ownership and kind of like private land. And I just wonder if you could talk more about that. Do you mean just as it relates to energy and where the energy is coming from, like land around windmills and solar panels, or is it all sorts of land? Because yeah. it's all tied up in all sorts of things. Everything. So. All right, there's a, uh, several clauses in the Constitution. One is the taking clause, and it's actually being used now. Uh, it's called the uh, WOTUS, the, the water, uh, I don't know what it stands for. Uh, states are challenging 
uh, the Obama administration's protection of water uh, from um, you know, use that is not in the public purpose. And they are challenging that on the basis of the takings clause and calling it land grab and everything. But generally, there's you know, several clauses in the Constitution which you know, basically says private property is, the, is a right to own. And so when you do that, you know, that's not how Native Americans lived in America. They shared, you know, they figure in, in many other traditional uh, places, they shared limited resources. You know, in times of scarcity, in times of surplus, a stranger will come into um, your little village or whatever, and they, they're responsible with, for sharing their food with others, but that's not how our Constitution is, is structured. So uh, there is, um, I don't think it's in the book, but, but I do have an article, if you go online, about what, um, what is it called? I give the details about the clauses that you can find and what, it, what the implications are. What is it called? What clean energy activists can learn from abolitionists, something like mm. that. Just Google Denise Fairchild. You'll get more cool. details. Thanks. Okay. Thank you all very much for having me out. I enjoyed the conversation. <laughs>